and I returned back into my life in Southern California, and I wasn't the same person. I couldn't complain about anything with my friends. What was I going to complain about? I was the happiest guy in the world. I couldn't connect with people around the same things that were once valuable to me because I was different. And I had a lot of time to myself to think, a lot of time. And so I walked back into my life, and in a very short amount of time, I moved to the Pacific Northwest, and I retreated from the world. And I studied spirituality, and I wanted to understand what this idea is, who am I, as you learned this morning, and what am I doing here, and what is this all about? And uh, got very, very passionate about science, and as I said this morning when we started, science to me is the contemporary language of mysticism. The moment you start talking about tradition or culture, or you talk about religion, you divide an audience, but science tends to unify a community. And if it's explained in a simple way, then it empowers people about themselves and to begin to come out of their resting state and apply it to see if you could have the experience of that philosophy so you can understand the truth or the wisdom behind it. And so after a period of time, I started getting very antsy and I wanted to see if there were other people around the world that were sick or diseased in some way, and if they were treating conventionally or unconventionally, uh, if they got better all of a sudden. And I wanted to know what the cause was that produced that effect. So I traveled to about 17 different countries and I interviewed people that were diagnosed with cancer and diabetes and heart conditions and rare genetic disorders that medical science had no solution for, lupus and MS. And, and all of a sudden, these people had a very quick change in their health. And I wanted to know the correlation between the cause and the effect. And uh, I started writing my first book called Evolve Your Brain, The Science of Changing Your Mind. And I was very passionate about the neuroscience of what people did in their mind. And so right around that time, the movie What the Bleep came out, and Will Arns, the producer, writer, and director of What the Bleep, you know, approached me and said, you know, do you want to be in this movie? You know, this is what it's about. We're going to marry quantum physics with neuroscience, with neuroendocrinology, with genetics. We're going to tell a story about emotions and past and how people perceive their reality. So I didn't think anything of it. I said, yeah, sure, I'll be in it. And uh, they kept calling me, me up after the movie was done, and they kept saying, you're going to be a rock star. And I kept saying, I don't want to be a rock star. They kept saying, you're going to be a rock star. I said, I don't want to be a rock star. <laughs> and the movie became an overnight sensation around the world. And after the movie, I went through a lot of personal changes because when you're in a position where you're giving information to people, you have to also separate yourself from the ideal to the world and have the ideal for yourself. And I reached the point where I was so busy that I wasn't actually even practicing everything that I was talking about. So it was an opportunity for me again to separate myself from the world again and start to reevaluate what was important. And so when I wrote and finished Evolve Your Brain, there were four principles that I saw that were common to people that had spontaneous remissions from disease. And the first one, of course, was that every single person that I interviewed absolutely knew and understood that there was an intelligence that was giving them life that they had to connect with, that they had to interact with and develop a two-way relationship with that there is some unseen force, this power within us that's giving us life, and that they took time out of their busy day to begin to interact with it, to give it a plan and a template, and then so open their heart and surrender it to a greater mind and ask it to resolve it in a way that was right for them. And they made it very important. Basically, they said, 
when my will matches your will, when my mind matches your mind, and when my love and appreciation for life matches your love and appreciation for life, you have to answer the call. And so these people were common people. They weren't nuns or monks or priests or rabbis. They weren't scholars. They weren't academics. Some of them were, but most of them were common people just like you and I. And the second thing they had in common is that they understood that it was their own mismanagement of their life and their energy that created their disease. That they were living the majority of their life in a state of pain, in a state of fear, in a state of hostility, in a state of anger. And it was those emotions from past experiences that they were still carrying around with them. And those emotions were driving certain thoughts. And those thoughts were reinforcing certain emotions and those emotions were driving the same thoughts. And the way you think and the way you feel creates a state of being. And I say that thoughts are the language of the mind and the brain and feelings are the language of your body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. And so these people got caught up in the cycle of thinking and feeling in the same way for so long that it became their familiar state of being. And they said that they had to break the habit of being themselves. That the redundancy of that cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking over time conditions your body to memorize that state as well as your conscious mind. And whenever the body becomes the mind, that's called the habit. A habit is when your body is your mind. Now, 95% of who you are by the time you're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors and emotional reactions, beliefs and perceptions that function just like a subconscious computer program. So when people get about the business of change and they're going to use 5% of their conscious mind to go against 95% of what they've memorized subconsciously, for the most part, the moment the person has a stray thought or reacts to something in their environment, they return back to the same self and the program begins to run again. So if a habit is when the body becomes the mind, then to truly change then is to be greater than your body. To be greater than the emotional memories and addictions and habits and behaviors that keep us restrained to the same self. Now, what I learned from these people is that when we go from the old self to the new self, we have to cross this river of change. And the moment we no longer think the same way, or no longer act the same way, or no longer feel the same way, the moment we begin to become conscious of our unconscious self, that's the moment we step in the river of change. And the moment we step in that river of change, we no longer feel like ourselves any longer. And for most people, the moment you don't feel like yourself, your body, which has become the mind, sends a signal back to the brain to cause you to think equal to the way you've been feeling for the last 20 years. And so when we break that chemical continuity, the body as the mind wants us to return back to that familiar state of being. And if we listen to those thoughts as if they're true, those thoughts will always lead to the same choices. The same choices will always lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors will always create the same experiences and the same experiences will create the same emotions and those same emotions will drive the same feelings and the person will say, this feels right. But in fact, it just feels familiar. Now, when we go from the old self to the new self, there is a biological, neurological, chemical, genetic death of the old self. There is a biological withering breakdown of the old self that's connected to a feeling. 
And when you begin to understand that crossing the river of change, you're not going to feel like yourself any longer, and the body is going to go through its own breaking of addictions emotionally, then the best way then to predict in this place, this void, this unknown, is to create, to create a new self. And these people actually began to do something amazing. They began to reinvent a new self. That's the third thing they understood, that they had to begin to think differently. Now we think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. Out of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts that we think in one day, 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. So the same thoughts will always lead to the same choices, yes? Same choices will always create the same behaviors. The same behaviors will create the same experiences. And the same experiences will always create the same emotions. And those same emotions will drive the same thoughts. And that's called a personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality who's sitting here today has created their present personal reality called their life. Which means then, if you wanted to create a new personal reality, then you would have to start to think about what you've been thinking about, yes? And change it, yes? And you would have to begin to pay attention to those habits and behaviors and become conscious of them, yes? And then you would have to look at the emotions that you've memorized that keep you connected to the past and ask yourself, are these emotions loving to me? And so I realized that most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality and it doesn't work. We literally have to become somebody else. So then you would have to agree with me then that all this information that you're learning today n would inspire new thoughts, yes? And new thoughts should lead to new choices, yes? And new choices should lead to new behaviors. And new behaviors should lead to new experiences. And then new experiences should create new emotions, yes? And new emotions should inspire new thoughts, and that's called evolution, yes? So then those emotions that Greg uh, was talking about this morning, that the majority of people in the Western world spend the majority of their life living by the hormones of stress. Now stress is when your body's knocked out of homeostasis. The stress response is what your body innately does to return itself back to order. That's the first definition of resilience. Now you have three types of stress. You have physical stress, like an injury, an accident, a fall, a trauma. You have chemical stress, like uh, viruses and bacteria and blood sugar levels and heavy metals and hormones and foods and hangovers. And then you have emotional stress, right? Traffic jams and internet connections and second mortgages and single parenting and 401ks. And each one of those things knocks your brain and body out of balance. And all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. If the deer gets chased by a pack of coyotes, if the deer outruns the coyotes, 15 minutes later it goes back to grazing and the stress is over. Human beings are different. We can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. You can begin to think about some future worst case scenario and because the privilege of human beings is that we can make thought more real than anything else, we can focus on that possibility to the exclusion of everything else. And you can knock your body out of physiological balance just by thought alone and your body as the unconscious mind believes it's in that experience in the present moment. And we can unfold Bas, uh, past bitter memories that are, that are tattooed in the recesses of our gray matter and like magic we bring them to life and in that moment it's real. And so the hormones of stress long term push the genetic buttons that create disease 
and no organism can tolerate living in emergency mode for extended periods of time. So then think about this. You can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. How many people have done that? You've done that? It's called being human, right? And we know that the hormones of stress dysregulate and downregulate genes to create disease. So that means then your thoughts can make you sick. So here's my question. If your thoughts can make you sick, can your thoughts make you well? I'm talking to the right audience. <laughs> so then the hormones of stress, though, give the body and brain a rush of energy. And it's like a narcotic. It becomes a drug. And people become very addicted to the adrenaline and the stress hormones. And they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their emotional addiction so they can remember who they think they are. The bad relationship, the bad job, the terrible circumstances, all of that is in place because the person needs that to reaffirm their emotional addiction. Because God forbid they couldn't feel anything. So then if the hormones of stress become like a narcotic, and you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone, then we could become addicted to our own thoughts. How many people are still with me? So then if you become addicted to your own thoughts when it, becomes t when it comes time to change, then you can understand then, just like an addict, the moment you're no longer thinking certain thoughts that are making certain chemicals for you to feel a certain way, and those feelings drive the same thoughts, you know, like if you have an insecure thought, you begin to feel insecure, right? Come on. And the moment you feel insecure, you're going to think more insecure thoughts, yes? And if you keep doing that for 20 or 30 years, it's going to feel pretty familiar, yeah? And then you're going to say, I am insecure. Well, whenever you say, I am anything, what you're saying is you're commanding your mind and body towards a destiny. So if the body has been conditioned to the mind of insecurity, don't you think then the moment you're no longer going to think insecure thoughts and fire and wire those circuits in your brain and then produce the blend of chemicals for you to feel that way, don't you know your body is going to do what? It's going to look back up at your brain and say, hey, I modified my receptor sites for you. We've been doing this for 20 years. I'm counting on those chemicals coming. Now you're just going to stop? And it's going to start sending signals back to the brain. And the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And so these people understood that their 20 years of hatred or their 30 years of anger or their 15 years of fear or insecurity was the very reason that they were sick. And because feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, and we can remember experiences better because we can remember how they feel, if uh, the environment signals the gene and the environment produces a chemical reaction, then as long as you're feeling the same way every single day, there's no new information coming from the environment, and you keep signaling the same gene. How many people are with me? So then the emotions of anger and aggression and hurt and hostility and hatred and prejudice and fear and anxiety and insecurity and hopelessness and powerlessness and depression, guilt and shame, those are all familiar emotions to us because we've experienced the events correlated with them. How many people are still with me? And it's those emotions that are derived from the hormones of stress and if you keep knocking your body out of balance, that imbalance becomes the new balance and you're headed for some type of disease. And these people began to realize that they had to change that. And when we react to something or someone in our life, there's always a change in our chemical state. We're altered in some way. And if you don't know how to control your emotional reaction to that event in your life, and that chemical refractory period continues for hours or days, that's called a mood. What's wrong with you? I'm in a mood. Oh, really? Why? 
thought you'd never ask. <laughs> well, this thing happened to me five days ago, and I'm living by the same emotional reaction. Now, if you keep that refractory period going on for weeks or months, that's called a temperament. Why is he so angry? I don't know. Why are you so angry? Well, this experience happened to me nine months ago. And I'm living by the same emotional reaction. One long refractory period. And if you keep it going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And most people wear their emotions layer by layer. And they believe that's who they are. And there was an article in Scientific American just two months ago that scientists said that 50% of what you say about your past is not true. Because <laughs> you're not the same person. You make up stuff. And so then, if feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences... Now, stay with me. Did Greg say we need to think differently? Yes? So how many people in this audience believe that the way you think has something to do with your life? You do, yes? Okay, so feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, yes? You can remember experiences better because you can remember how they feel, yes? So then, if you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, are you thinking in the future or are you thinking in the past? And as long as you're thinking in the past, what are you creating more of? Quantum model of reality still applies. And so, if you're feeling the same way every single day, then according to our biological model, it means nothing new is happening in your life. Is that right? Because how many potentials exist in the quantum field? How many? So, with every new experience, there should be a pretty good emotion, right? You should feel overjoyed or in awe and wonder or excited or inspired or in gratitude or appreciation, an elevated emotion. But living by those same familiar emotions means nothing new is happening in your life and the body as the unconscious mind, as long as we're living in the same familiar feelings, is believing it's in the same past experience 24 hours a day seven days a week, 365 days a year. And if the body's become the mind of that emotion, then the body literally is living in the past. And we can't create a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. So these people began to realize that no one or nothing was worth it. And that the hormones of stress endorse the ego for us to become selfish because when an animal is threatened by something in its external environment, the job of the organism in emergency and survival is to take care of the self. And we identify the self as a body in the environment and in time. When the zebra is being chased by the lion, she's only concerned about three things. Her body, like, I better take care of this, so I better put my attention on it. The environment, where am I going to go? And how much time do I have to get there? And when you and I live by the cocktail of those stress hormones, we obsess about our bodies, our hairstyle, our face, our weight, our problems, things in our environment, things we have, things we don't have, and we obsess about time. But that's not who you are. Because as long as you're living by the hormones of stress, you're living as a materialist. Because the hormones of stress cause us to believe that the outer world is more real than the inner world. And those hormones absolutely make us feel separate from possibility. Why? Because when you're being chased by a lion, it's not time to create. It's not time to trust. It's not time to learn. It's time for emergency. So the majority of people in the Western world spend the majority of their time preparing themselves for the worst case scenario and protecting themselves from it. They're basically trying to predict the future from the past. And you know, when we get it right, you know what we say, right? You need to hang out with me. See how smart I am? But what happens when it doesn't happen? 
That's called anxiety. That's called neurosis. It's called insomnia. And so when we live by the hormones of stress and we're defining reality by our senses, we become materialists because we feel separate from possibility and all of our attention goes on our bodies, the environment, and time. Another way to say that is, from a quantum perspective, the atom is 99.9999% energy and information. And we're putting all of our attention on the particle. And we're missing out on possibility. And so these people had to hit a point of crisis where they finally started taking their attention off their outer world and started to ask themselves some bigger questions. Who am I? What is a greater expression of myself? What would I have to change to be happy? Who in history do I admire that I want to be like? And they began to contemplate and speculate and rehearse who they were going to be if they got better. And the mere process of thinking about who they were going to be began to change their brain. And when you marry a clear intention, intention is a thoughtful process, with an elevated emotion, that's a heartfelt process, you move into a new state of being. And as they began to remind themselves every single day of who they no longer wanted to be, and they reminded themselves every day of who they did want to be, they began to cause their brain to fire in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations. And whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind. Because according to neuroscience, mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. So they reminded themselves every day of who they wanted to be, and they began to fire and wire new circuits in their brain that became the very platform of the foundation of who they would become. But here's the point. They said, I'm not getting up from this meditation until I feel like that person. Now, the privilege of being a human being is that we can make thought more real than anything else. And when the thought in their mind became the experience, their heart began to open and their body as the unconscious mind began to believe it was in that new future in the present moment and they were literally signaling new genes in new ways ahead of the environment and as they began to fall in love with themselves and gave thanks before it was mani made manifest the emotional signature of gratitude means the event has already happened and so now they were giving their body a taste or a sampling of the future in the present moment. And every day they, they did it over and over again. And they were unmemorizing emotions that kept them connected to the old self. And they were reconditioning the body to a new mind and to a new emotion. And that heart of theirs began to open. And they went from selfish to selfless. And they moved from a state of survival to a state of creation. And when they were no longer thinking and feeling in the same way, they moved into the fourth quality. They had long moments where they lost track of time and space. What they were doing in their inner world became so real to them that when they opened their eyes, they thought it would be 20 minutes later and it was an hour and 20 minutes later. And when they did that, that magnificent forebrain the crowning achievement of the human being, the frontal lobe, the creative center. It has connections to all other parts of your brain. And when you're asking open-ended questions like, what would it be like? How would it have to be? The frontal lobe, like a great symphony leader, looks out of the landscape of the entire brain and begins to select different networks of neurons and seamlessly pieces them together to create a new mind. And the moment the brain begins to fire in tandem, the frontal lobe creates a picture. And that picture is called an intention. And when you can make that picture more real than anything else, and you begin to feel inspired by it, your body's no longer living in the past. Now it's living in the future. And every day, as they no longer fired and wired the same circuits in their brain and emotionally signaled the same genes in the same way, they were moving into stasis, and then they began to reverse the process. 
And a new state of being is a new personality. And a new personality creates a new personal reality. So after I wrote Evolve Your Brain, <clears throat> and after What the Bleep, you know the most common question people asked when I was traveling around the world. How do you do it? How do you do this stuff? Why is it so hard to change? I mean, what do you do? And so we started teaching workshops around the world, and we were doing introductory levels, and we were using science and brainwave technology and breaking it down, and heart coherence so people could understand how powerful they really were. And so we started teaching these workshops after What the Bleep, and for the first year and about three or four months, guess what happened? Nothing. <laughs> I don't know if, I was, I, if it was me or just whatever it was, but there wasn't a lot happening. And then after about a year and a half or so, we started getting these emails. You know, people coming to the events, and the first line of every email was always the same. You're not going to believe this. My 20 years of hatred towards my father, you know, I just decided I didn't want to hate any longer, and my acid reflux went away. What do you know? Did I signal a new gene in a new way? And people started to correlate what they were doing. They were actually practicing it consistently, not as something that they had to do, but something that they wanted to do because they believed it was possible. And if you knew that you were a creator of reality, that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, if you knew that on a gut level, would you ever miss a day? Never miss a day. And would you ever let a thought slip by your awareness that you didn't want to experience? And so when we started seeing the feedback started to come in, we started people, people started saying, hey, I'm feeling better, things are starting to happen in my life. That was, for me, the most important point in my career because I knew on some level that we were making a difference in people's lives. And so people around the world started sending in these wonderful emails and I, I just was doing these in level one intensive workshops and then after I'd finished the workshop, people would say, um, can we do another one? I'd be like, okay, we'll, we'll do another one. So we did like these level twos and then after level two, someone said, can you do a level three? And I said, okay, we'll do a level three. Then after level three, someone said, can you do another one? I said, I don't think I know anything else. <laughs> but we kept doing them. I kept learning. And we were in Seattle uh, a couple years ago. And we, we did an, a, a progressive workshop. And there was a lady with MS whose wheelchair, her motorized wheelchair broke down and she came anyway. And <clears throat> by the end of that event, she was walking across the room unassisted with no limp and the motor functions in her leg came back. Now, I have to tell you, I was more surprised than anybody because now I knew that we were signaling new genes in new ways in real time. That I mean, we could talk about genes forever, but your genes are a library of potential. They are they're a library of possibility. They're a parts list. And when you begin to do something differently, when you begin to think something differently, when you begin to experience something differently, when you begin to emotionally embrace something differently, you're literally changing your genetic expression. And when you turn on new genes or activate new genes, you're, those genes turn on to make new proteins. So then people were literally turning the genes off or down-regulating the genes that had to do with their disease and up-regulating new genes right in their meditation and their body began to change before our eyes. We did another event then a few months later and another lady with MS was dancing around the front of the room. Now, <clears throat> there's a scientific part of me that I, I just couldn't overlook this. And I became very, very passionate about this idea called information to transformation. And I said that if it's happening in real time, people are doing amazing things. Common people just like you, you give them information, really profound information that has to do with the truth of the way reality really is. 
and you begin to have them share that information where they can repeat it. They're wiring it in their brain. Would you agree? If you can repeat something, it's in there, yes? The latest research that was done by Kandel, the Nobel Prize laureate, he said that when you learn a new bit of information, you double the connections in your brain in certain areas from about 1,300 to 2,600 new connections. As a matter of fact, every time you learn something new, you're making a new connection in there. That's what learning is. So he saw that you increase the number of connections in your brain just by learning a few bits of information, but if you don't revisit that information and review it, those connections prune apart within hours, within days. So it's important then for students to be able to learn the information and then repeat it. And then that information then, there should be some instruction. And to demystify it so that they can understand that they can have a new experience. And that new experience should produce some type of transformation. And if it's happening in real time, we should measure that transformation in our seminars. And if we can measure that transformation and begin to interpret it, synthesize it, all of that information then that we've measured is more information to teach transformation better. And if people continue to transform and we measure it, that's more information to teach transformation. And we begin to close the gap between knowledge and experience. How many people are with me? So this year in February, we did our first advanced workshop and we had people from all over the world come and it was in carefree Arizona and I brought in a team of technicians and neuroscientists and we brought in a physicist from uh, from uh, from st. Petersburg and I wanted to begin to measure transformation and we measured the energy field of the room because everybody says oh wow the energy was really great in the room well I wanted to see if there were physical changes taking place in the room. I wanted to measure the energy field around people's body. That if photons become excited and you begin to experience elevated emotions, emotions are just energy. And as Greg talked about, the coherence that's created from an elevated emotion broadcasts a signal into the field that is uh, you know, feet to meters wide. And then if we could measure all of those things and we can consistently have people retreat from their life for four days to no longer return back to the same environment that reminds them of who they think they are. So for four days, people retreated from their world and we started at six in the morning and we went till around six or seven at night. And these people were passionate about transformation. And we recorded amazing things. And I'm going to show you some of those pictures after we take a break. But it begs the question then, if your personality creates your personal reality, and you walk back into your life every single day, and you see the same people, and you go to the same places, and you do the same things at the exact same time, then it's your external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And as long as your same environment reminds you of who you are and you're thinking equal to your environment, then your, personal, your personal reality is creating your personality and there's a dance between the biology in your inner world and the experience in your outer world and that tango is called karma. So then to change then is to be greater than your environment, to be greater than the conditions in your world, to be greater than the circumstances in your life. And every great person in history knew this, whether it was William Wallace or Mahatma Gandhi or Joan of Arc or Martin Luther King, the Wright brothers, to have a vision, an idea, a dream, and to begin to no longer keep doing the same things as Greg said. Because all of the adversity in our life is to initiate us into greatness. It's to call out something greater in us. And so these people retreated from their life for four days and they took away the constant stimulation that reminded them of who they were long enough to change their brain and body to be ahead of their environment. 
And so we measured some amazing things in these people. We saw people with chronic diseases all of a sudden have normal bodies again. We've had people in our work that <clears throat> were diagnosed with rare genetic disorders. My th thinking was if I knew the things from the people that had spontaneous remissions that I studied what those commonalities were, we should be able to reproduce them, right? So that's why we developed the model of transformation in our workshops. I just did what people already knew how to do and just used the science to explain it. But we had to get people to reproduce it because anything that's repeatable is a scientific law or verges on a scientific law. So I wanted to see if we kept doing it, if we were able to produce some type of consistent change. And we started to see uh, some pretty amazing things take place. We did a second event in July of this year, and we, we partnered with HeartMath Institute, and people wore the monitors uh, for 24 hours, and we were measuring heart coherence with brain coherence. And I'll show you some pictures of some amazing people that sustained heart coherence for hours. It became a skill. As Greg said, once you know how to do it, you know how to do it. So when we live by the hormones of stress and all of the energy goes to these hormonal centers and away from the heart, of course the heart is going to be the first organ that's starved of energy. And when we live by the hormones of stress, we will always try to force the outcome. We'll always try to push and make it happen because we are matter trying to change matter. And one of the things I learned in studying people that did amazing things in these workshops is I watched a lady for a whole hour. I watched her brain on the scan and her brain was working so hard. And I, as I watched it over and over again, watched it over and over again, watched it over and over again, the more she tried to change, the worse her brain got. And I went up to her afterwards and I said, how, did, how was that for you? And she said, I had the worst meditation of my life. And something clicked in me in that moment, and I knew that most of us, we try to use our brain to change our brain. We try to use the ego to change the ego. We try to use the program to change the program, and it only endorses it. And in that moment, something clicked, and I knew that they had to become pure consciousness, that they had to get beyond their body, get beyond their environment and get beyond time. Because when you become pure consciousness, and we have all the biological and neurological machinery to do this, by the way, you come preloaded with everything you need. You don't need anything else. That when you forget about yourself, when you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time, and you become pure consciousness, a thought in possibility. The moment you are consciousness, now you have dominion over your body. Now you can change something in your environment, and now you can create some future time. And the moment we saw people become pure consciousness, and we will talk about that after the break, <laughs> the brain naturally gets organized. The hormones of stress when we are under the gun of the fight or flight nervous system, the brain and the heart move out of rhythm. It's like a group of people playing the drums all at the same time with no rhythm. It's noise. And that's what happens to the neural network in the heart and the neural networks in the brain. And they actually, if you saw the brain on a functional scan, it begins to compartmentalize. Different compartments of the brain are no longer communicating with each other because different communities are saying, hey, it's not a time to communicate now. There's a, there's a tiger on our back here. We've got to run. And so the long-term effects of stress causes the brain to move into what's called high beta brainwave patterns like driving your sports car in first gear. And different compartments of the brain no longer communicate with each other. And if you were to measure that on a brain scan, it's very erratic patterns. The moment you become pure consciousness, you forget about yourself. That's my definition of creation. The moment that happens, the brain goes, thank God he's out of the way. 
Now I can get organized again. The operator is finally gone for a few minutes. And we started in that event, in that February event, teaching people how to become pure consciousness. And when that happened, we saw their hearts get highly coherent, we saw their brains get highly coherent, and it's kind of an irony. If you want to change something about your body, you've got to forget about your body. You want to change something, problem in your life, you've got to forget about your life. You want to create some future time, you have to forget about time. You have to become no face, no gender, no profession. You have to become pure consciousness. And we saw it over and over again that 91% of our people that had their brain scanned in our first event had a more than 80% change in their brain for the better. And there was no drugs, there was no you know, therapies. They just went through the process of observing their thoughts and becoming conscious of their unconscious thoughts because they're no longer being distracted by their environment. Pay attention to their behaviors and their actions and look at the body as the mind and the emotions and master that. In the first day, the energy in the room, we measured it, guess what happened to it? It went down. Because people who are breaking all their emotional ties to their known familiar life but when we went to that next day and they became pure consciousness, the energy in the room began to rise. And when we saw that, it was miraculous. And we measured the energy as it began to continuously improve. And when we did our event in July, we started seeing people having enormous amounts of energy that were stored in their body travel up through their heart and into their brain and we captured people with a full-on kundalini experience full-on ecstasy in their brain and they were common people just like you and boy I tell you what after that experience they could care less about their checking account <laughs> they could care less about their problems and we saw one lady move into such a state of ecstasy we were watching her on the camera on the screen like this and all of a sudden we saw, saw her brain get very organized the front of the brain talking to the back of the brain the back with the front side to side strong level of coherence and all of a sudden she went into this high uh, consciousness state called gamma brain waves and gamma brain waves is super consciousness and I looked at that screen and I looked at the neuroscientist and I looked at him again and I said I think she's in ecstasy. And we turned around, and she had tears running down her face. She was so connected to something greater. She didn't want the experience to end. She, I'm going to show you pictures of her brain. She wanted, to, she, she wanted the moment to elongate. She felt so connected, and all of a sudden, when that posterior pituitary turned on and released all that oxytocin into her brain, guess what it did to the amygdala where all the stress circuits are? It, it, it anesthetized, it shut down fear, it shut down hostility, it shut down sadness. Those circuits are turned off when oxytocin is like that. And the heart begins to open its vascular channels and motility increases and she feels connected to something greater. And she would never try to force the outcome in that moment. She's already connected to the outcome. She's trusting in the outcome. And we saw it with more than one person. And so the concept of information to transformation is to empower you that it's possible. That all of this information and science and everything that's coming out right now is for us to do something with. And this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. It's a time in history to know how. And when you give common people the opportunity to understand the truth about themselves, and then you inspire them to go out and try it, to try it like a scientist. Hey, I'm going to change the way I think and feel. I should see some effect in my life. In the moment I can correlate the feedback in my life with what I did, I'm going to do it again. And so we've had people around the world heal themselves of all kinds of conditions. 
We've had people win the lottery. We've had people create new opportunities for themselves because nobody is so special to be excluded from this phenomenon. And the phenomenon is that you are a creator. And when you live by the hormones of stress, you forget that, and so do I. And when we live by the hormones of stress, we are always trying to change matter by being matter. We're being a brain trying to change a brain. We're being matter trying to change something in our life. But when people begin to understand how to apply these principles and they begin to practice them and make them a skill, and the more you practice it, the better you get at it. So think about this. What if you woke up in the morning and instead of getting out of bed and doing the same thing as you did the day before and going through the same routine as you did for the last five years, what if you woke up in the morning and you said, you place your hand over your heart and you say, I'm going to teach you what it feels like to be noble today. I'm going to train you to know what abundance is. And you begin to marry a clear intention with an elevated emotion and you memorize that feeling and you're able to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day get ready because something unusual is going to happen in your life that's the law and the hardest part about all of this hardest part is simply making the time to do it making time for our precious selves to decide then well, geez, I want to be wealthy and abundant. Well, if I want to be wealthy and abundant, then I can't feel lack because a wealthy person never feels lack. And if I feel lack, I'm going to attract lack. Gold only attracts gold. Lead doesn't attract gold. And so then when we see our life now as an initiation and we have to meet the conditions in our life from a greater level of mind every day, then wouldn't it be a good idea every day to ask yourself a question like, what is the greatest expression of myself that I can be today? One lifetime today. Can I demonstrate love? Can I be patient? Can I be filled with energy and enthusiasm? Can I give? Who in history do I admire that I want to be like? And you begin to rehearse a new way of being and begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain so you have the circuits in place that when you open your eyes you're somebody else and you get that heart-centered emotion going you move out of these survival centers and the moment you open your heart it's a fact the heart math institute did the research take a clear intention and marry it with an elevated emotion and you change matter you alter DNA at a distance because the thoughts you think are like the electrical charge in the quantum field and the feelings that you emote are like the magnetic charge and how you think and how you feel broadcast an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life so what are you broadcasting every day so if you were able to practice it and change your brain and body ahead of the environment every day then, you know, your friends would go, you look different. Did you change your hairstyle? No. no. Really? Did you shave your mustache? No, never had a mustache. Really? <laughs> Did you lose weight? No. No. Whoa. Wow. Something's different about you because they're sensing a change in energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. How many people are with me? So, great time to be alive, would you agree? Yes. You, we've signed up for this. Yes. But listen, you can't stand up and in the name of spirituality say, hey, let's all live in gratitude and get in your car and be like, hey, get out of the way, you know, <laughs> cut people off. What's that? That's like, you know, eating a delicious, you know, vegetarian organic breakfast and then spending the rest of your day eating junk food that you have to lay down the very, we have to lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want for something greater to happen. And it means that all of the conditions in our outer world somehow reflect some aspect of us. 
And if you want peace in the world, you better not be arguing with your coworker. It doesn't work that way. And if you want to experience true, true fascination for life, make time for fascination. I was in Barcelona a little ways back and I was invited to speak to the, to, uh, the ministry of the, all the ministries in the government there, 17 different ministries. And they're in a crisis right now. And the one thing I didn't want to be was some know-it-all American, you know. And I said, how do you become supernatural? You got to start doing what's unnatural. When there's a crisis and everybody is in lack, that's the time to give. When everybody else is in fear, that's the time to demonstrate courage. When everybody else is hostile and judging, that's the time to show compassion. And if we can continuously do over and over again what is so unnatural, sooner or later we'll become supernatural. Wouldn't you agree? So then if you're working on your anger and your frustration and I'm working on my fear and my anxiety and my judgment and I'm taking care of me and you're taking care of you, then everybody was doing that, we would sooner or later start to see some change in the world. Yes? So then we have to begin to start somewhere. And the place we start then is looking within and beginning to look at some of those emotions that keep us anchored to the past that literally begin to, to break us down. And if a person can move into an elevated state of being every day and they understand that they're signaling new genes just by doing that, just by doing it. If you have that understanding, you will produce greater results. You take a group of hotel maids from Latin America and you watch them in one day move mattresses around and move beds and move furniture and you follow the amount of activity they do and you watch how much they eat. They did this experiment. They found that all of these maids were actually burning more calories than they were eating and they were actually surpassing the Surgeon General's requirement for exercise. So they divided the maids in two categories and they told the one group of maids, hey, you know what? Exercise is really good for your heart. You know what it does? Not only is it good for your heart, but it also lowers your body fat index and it shrinks your waist and gave them all these benefits of exercise. One month later, guess what happened? Maids were doing the exact same thing that they were always doing, but they lost weight, the heart rate went down, they had a smaller uh, waist size, lean body mass went down. Why? Because they had intention behind what they were doing. They assigned meaning to what they were doing. And so, if a group of elderly men can retreat from their life for five days and go to a retreat center north of Boston, all these men in their 70s and 80s, and they were told to act like they were 22 years younger. Just pretend. And they had, you know, magazines with uh, Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe movies and, you know, and they had papers with current events. And for five days, they hung out with other men and they just pretended like they were 22 years younger. They took height measurements, weight measurements, range of motion measurements, finger length measurements, uh, extremity measurements, and cognitive tests. At the end of five days, guess what? 60% better scores on cognition. Finger lengths, all of them, longer. Range of motion, all improved. Some of them were playing touch football again without their canes. <laughs> Who are you pretending to be? Because if you can begin to understand that when you begin to change your state of being, that a thought begins to activate new neural networks in your brain. New neural networks in your brain begin to fire and wire to create a hologram or a picture. 
That hologram or picture signals the limbic brain to make neuropeptides. And neuropeptides are chemical messengers that signal hormones. And hormones and neuropeptides begin to dock on receptor sites of cells. And cells begin to get a new message and signal new genes. And new genes make new proteins. And new proteins means the expression of life. And the expression of life is equal to the health of your body just by changing the thought. So then, if you woke up every morning and you pretended to be genius of the universe, unlimited mind, healthy, you would probably have to stop on the side of the road with your pen and write down the download that you were getting from the field because you never thought in that way. And so you and I have been hypnotized and conditioned into believing that we need a reason for joy, that we need a reason to give thanks, we need a reason to feel inspired. That's the old model of reality, of Newtonian physics, of cause and effect. Wait for something outside of you to change how you feel inside of you. And the moment you feel better inside of you, you pay attention to who caused it outside of you. And that event's called the memory. That's cause and effect. Quantum model of reality, as Greg said, is about causing an effect. Begin to change how you think and feel, broadcast the whole new electromagnetic signature and give thanks before the event is made manifest. Materialists would never do that, but the quantum mind, the immaterialist, always does that because the moment you begin to observe a new future, that's called intention, with an elevated energy, you are causing infinite waves of possibility to begin to collapse into new patterns of information called your life. But if you're observing your life from the same level of mind every day and you begin to anticipate the next experience based on your past I'm curious tell me where the unknown is going to show up in your life is there any room for that it would just be too inconvenient the alien ship landed in the back are you kidding me dancing with the stars is on tonight I... <laughs> can they come back tomorrow I'm busy so this is inconvenient So this is a time in history where we have to meet these challenges with a greater level of mind. And we can't keep doing the same things, thinking the same thoughts, performing the same actions, and living by the same emotions and ex secretly expecting our life to change. We have to meet all of these challenges and we have to be the heroes and the heroines that begin to leave a legacy in this particular time. There's a stigma that you and I have been conditioned into believing that all leaders get it in the end. Hmm? Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, William Wallace, Joan of Arc, they all got it in the end. It's a subconscious, subconscious conditioning that leaders somehow pay the price with their life. You ever see a group of birds that all move in the same direction? You ever see the fish that all swim in the same. If you study that phenomenon in biology, that's called emergence. You would think that there's a leader, like there's a, it's a top-down phenomenon. Turns out there's no leader. It's a bottom-up phenomenon. Everybody is leading. There's one mind, one consciousness. So you can't take out all leaders if everybody's leading, now could you? So this is a time in history where emergence is the model that we have to lead by example. And all of this information is to empower you to understand that it's possible. 